It is now my great privilege to introduce someone who truly needs no introduction here, the distinguished author and editor of a number of best-selling books, including A Patriot's Handbook and Profiles in Courage for Our Time, a dedicated and inspiring supporter of New York City's public schools, and above all, for us here at the Kennedy Library, the person who has done more than anyone to make this great institution all that it is today. Please join me in welcoming the president of the Kennedy Library Foundation, Caroline Kennedy. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, it's really an honor um, for the Kennedy Library to be able to host such a distinguished panel and for me to be able to introduce them. Um, I, I recently um, put together a book about patriotism, which some of you waited online very nicely, um, and we had a chance to talk, but, um, but I think this is exactly the kind of subject that um, this library is uniquely situated to explore, and so um, I hope that you'll find lots of things to think about when you walk um, away this afternoon and on the next hour and a half. Um, I really feel, and having uh, put together this book and, and traveled around talking about it and being asked questions about patriotism, it really prompted my thinking. Um, and I really do believe that over the past two years, um, everybody has thought more about what does it mean to be an American. And I think there was a period of cynicism and disengagement, um, but really in the last two years since September 11th and then the war in Iraq, there has been an outpouring of patriotism. Um, and it's more than just a sense of pride in our heritage. It's really a willingness to know and understand the values um, that have shaped this country. And I think it's also a desire to serve and to give back and to play a part in shaping the future, to question the direction that our country is going in. For those of us who are parents and grandparents, I think it's really an opportunity uh, once again to think about what kind of values and what kind of society we want to pass on to our children. And for our children, I think it's a chance to realize that growing up, um, there are really responsibilities that come with citizenship as well as the privileges um, of being an American. In my family, I know I was lucky because the adults really taught by example and they passed on the idea to us that one is never too old or too young for public service and that if we are lucky enough to live in the greatest country in the world, we really do have a responsibility to understand the sources of its greatness and to give back wherever we can. In his farewell address, Ronald Reagan said that what our country needs is an informed patriotism, one that is grounded in thoughtfulness and knowledge uh, and begins at the family dinner table. As parents, really, we can't expect our children to absorb the values of freedom or equality or tolerance, diversity, uh, hard work on their own. I think they only really have meaning if our children know that they are important to us. Um, I think that's really why we've all come here today to talk about what we mean by values and how we understand the idea of patriotism in our time right now. Um, in the process of researching a Patriot's Handbook, I was reminded um, over and over that really unlike almost any other country, um, America was founded on ideas. And our history is really the story of our effort to live up to the promises that were made in the Declaration of Independence. And even though We've often stumbled on our journey. I think the fact that we do have the oldest constitution in the world is really proof of the enduring power of those ideas. It did take a civil war and then another 100 years for the promises of the Declaration of Independence to be kept, for the Supreme Court to strike down segregation and Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act. And just as, poor, as important as these judicial and legislative milestones, were the words that Martin Luther King delivered in his famous I Have a Dream speech in Washington. And I think in, in the language that every American now knows, King rearticulated the American dream and tied it back to the Declaration of Independence and our founding ideals of freedom and equality. And through his eloquence, I think it recommitted our whole country to these ideals. And so time and again, we see um, how the importance of these founding ideals and how they're continued and brought up today constantly and it's really the power of words that makes that happen. So that's why I think it's so important that we're familiar with the touchstones of our history and we really need to be able to include them in our national conversation if we want to build the society that we want. And so I think in the days before television, 
and the explosion of entertainment, families really pass these ideas down and these words down by reading and reciting them. And I know in, in my own family, a gathering was never complete without a recitation by my grandmother of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. And, um, and it appealed to us as children, but it really was a powerful way of her transmitting her belief that one person could really change the course of history. And that was done in a way that children could really understand and respond to. And I think from the beginning, our leaders recognize that we really are all in this together, and we do have more in common than, than divides us. Our democracy is based on individual freedom, and that includes the freedom of speech. It also includes the freedom to disagree. And I think it goes right back to the beginning, and Thomas Jefferson won the presidency um, in another uh, election, which took Congress 36 ballots to award victory. Um, and so after our recent experience, it's good to think back that Thomas Jefferson came out of such a process. Um, and in his first inaugural address, he told Americans to put aside their bitter partisanship and accept the majority decision, um, but always to protect the rights of the minority as well. And he said, at that time, let us then, fellow citizens, unite with one heart and one mind. Every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. I think one of the most difficult issues for each of us to face, and I know I got asked it a lot on my book tour, is how to really express patriotism when you might disagree um, with things, some things that the government um, is doing and how that you feel that we're not living up to these ideals. And I think some of the most eloquent writings about freedom and patriotism often have come from those to whom it was denied. Frederick Douglass uh, certainly um, captured this dilemma uh, more powerfully than, than almost anyone else. Um, he, as most people know, was a runaway slave who fled to England and only returned to America after his freedom had been bought by some English friends, and he had the following to say um, about patriotism. Um, I know this kind of talk is not agreeable to what are called patriots. Indeed, some have called me a traitor, but two things are necessary to make a traitor. One is, he shall have a country. And I believe if I had a country, I should be a patriot. But when I remember that my grandmother reared 12 children for the southern slave market, and when she became too much racked for toil, she was turned out by a professed Christian master, and the institutions of this country sanctioning and sanctifying this crime, I have no patriotism. So long as my voice can be heard, I will hold America up to the lightning scorn of moral indignation. In doing this, I feel myself discharging the duty of a true patriot, for he is a lover of his country who rebukes and does not excuse its sins. The process of becoming an American is one that many of us, all of us really, I think, take for granted, and it is easy to romanticize it from a few generations out, but it has never been an easy one. Um, and I think that um, the power of the ideal of America is what brought so many people here, and I think um, there's just one quote about that that I would like to read and then turn it over to the panel. Um, it's by Mario Puzo, who's the author of The Godfather, and he writes of his youth in the Italian neighborhood of Hell's Kitchen. Um, and he talks about the first book that he was planning to write. When I came to my autobiographical novel, the one every writer does about himself, I planned to make myself the sensitive, misunderstood hero, much put upon by his mother and family. But to my astonishment, my mother took over the book, and instead of my revenge, I got another comeuppance. All those old, grim Italians that I hated, then pitied so patronizingly, turned out to be heroes. Through no desire of mine, I was surprised. The thing that amazed me most was their courage. Where were their congressional medals of honor? their distinguished service crosses. How did they ever have the guts to get married, have kids, go out and earn a living in a strange land with no skills, not even knowing the language? They made it without tranquilizers, without sleeping pills, <laughs> without psychiatrists, without even a dream. Heroes, heroes all around me. I never saw them. But how could I? They wore lumpy work clothes and handlebar mustaches. They blew their noses on their fingers. They spoke a laughable, broken English, and the furthest limit of their horizon was their daily bread. Bent on survival, they narrowed their minds to the thinnest levels of existence. It's no wonder that in my youth I found them contemptible. And yet, they sailed the ocean to come to a new land and leave their sweated bones in America. 
illiterate Columbos, they dared to seek the promised land. And so they, too, dreamed a dream. I think that dream is really why we're all here today, and it's one of the amazing accomplishments of America, that we have been able to preserve a sense of national unity in a country of people from so many different backgrounds. I hope that books and conversations like this will encourage people to learn more and piece together their own collage and conversation, choose the voices that speak to them, and add their voice to the ongoing dialogue. We are fortunate to have that opportunity today with a very distinguished panel to guide us. Our moderator, Derek Bach, has been a professor of law and president of Harvard University, has written numerous books on higher education and politics. He is currently a professor at the Kennedy School of Government and the chair of Common Cause. Jill Kirk-Conway is a historian and author and board member of the Kennedy Library. Um, she is renowned for, for her memoirs, which recount her journey from the Australian outback to serving as the first female president of Smith College. Louis Menand is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Metaphysical Club. He writes for the New York Review of Books and The New Yorker and is a professor of English at Harvard University. Robert Pinsky is the only poet to have been named Poet Laureate of the United States for three consecutive terms, during which time he launched the nationwide Favorite Poem Project dedicated to celebrating and documenting and promoting the role of poetry in Americans' lives, and he is a professor at Boston University. Daniel Shore is the last of Edward R. Murrow's legendary CBS News team, still fully active in journalism. He uh, currently interprets national and international events as a senior news analyst for National Public Radio, and his voice can be heard in our museum downstairs covering President Kennedy's historic address at the Berlin Wall. Roger Wilkins is a professor of history and American culture at George Mason University. He's a former assistant attorney general, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for his coverage of Watergate, and the author of Jefferson's Pillow, The Founding Fathers and the Dilemma of Black Patriotism. If one of the definitions of patriotism includes contributing to your community and giving back to your country as much as you receive, then each of our panelists is truly an American patriot. Now I would like to ask Derek Bach to launch this conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Carolyn, thank you. <clears throat> well, patriotism is in many ways a mysterious word. Uh, we have one tradition in our country that thinks of patriots as heroes, of bulwarks of their nation, as defenders of the American way of life. Uh, but there is another strand of thought that has been with us for a very long time uh, that casts a much more skeptical eye on patriotism. Uh, one thinks of Samuel Johnson 250 years ago who uh, uttered the famous quote that patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. Uh, so clearly we have very different contrasting approaches to the word uh, reflected in those two traditions. Uh, one wonders whether they really have the same word in mind. Uh, that is itself uh, continues to be an issue in the wake of 9-11 and the war on terrorism. Uh, you have on the one hand Congress responding to the war of, on, on uh, terrorism by passing something uh, which it calls the Patriot Act which in turn is roundly condemned by many opponents as oppression wrapped in an American flag. Uh, so uh, this is a very much a contested term. And we have a distinguished panel to uh, discuss this elusive word and uh, to debate what its contemporary significance is in the United States. Uh, contrary to the usual practice, although I gather it is not the practice mercifully, uh, in this library, but uh, contrary to the usual practice for debates of this kind, uh, we are not going to have formal opening remarks by each of the panelists. We are going to plunge right into a conversation first among the panelists themselves and then uh, reserving time uh, toward the end for uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so uh, we will move immediately, uh, and I will simply try to uh, throw a match into the tinderbox uh, and get the discussion going uh, by, I think, starting in the obvious place by asking uh, how one would, we really ought to define 
patriotism, since different people seem to take it so many different ways. Uh, is it about love of country? Does it imply obligations? Uh, to whom are we loyal and why? Um, and since we're asking for a definition, and since one member on the panel is actually a professor of English and American language of literature, uh, I think it is uh, my uh, solemn uh, obligation to call on Louis Manan to answer, first of all, uh, that general question, uh, to give us a working definition of the term patriotism. Well, it's, it's nice to be the dictionary on the uh, <laughs> panel. Um, well, let me answer the question in a, as an English professor would, in a roundabout and oblique way. Um, <laughs> I grew up in New England, and um, when I was 21, I moved to New York City. And uh, so I've lived in New York City for 30 years. But I've always been a Red Sox fan. So <laughs> I take no credit for this, as you'll see shortly. Um, so I know what it's like to be an illegal alien <laughs> in a hegemonic power. And this is what it's like. You, you talk to New Yorkers about the Yankees, and they act as though they had something to do, personally, with the Yankee success. And what you want to say to them is, you just happen to be born in New York. That's all you have to do with the Yankees. It's owned by a rich guy, goes out and buys the best player to bring to New York. They become New Yorkers, please, really. They have nothing to do with New York. And then you feel loyal to the Yankees. Okay. So what I want to suggest is this. Patriotism depends a, depends a little bit on a fiction, and the fiction is that we've chosen to be Americans. Now, some of us in this room and some of us on the panel have chosen to be Americans when they had other choices, but most of us just happen to be born here. So I want to suggest that patriotism or love of country, a healthy way to think of it is to think this. When you're born, you're handed certain things. You're handed your parents. You're handed your the color of your skin, you're handed your gender, and you're handed the place you were born, New York City or the United States of America. Those are things, those are things that you can do something with. You can do something with those things. And virtue and character comes from choosing to do something with them rather than simply taking credit for something that you had nothing to do with. That's patriotism. Roger. Well, I hate to disagree with a professor of English. Let's talk about choice for a minute. I was handed the New York Yankees when I was nine years old. <laughs> and I lived across the river from Yankee Stadium. And I was a Yankee fan for 41 years until I could no longer stand Steinbrenner. <laughs> So I resigned as a Yankee fan in an op-ed piece in the New York Times. And I declared myself to be a fan of the well-managed, well-owned Baltimore Orioles. The hardest thing I ever did was to wean myself off the Yankees. But I exercised choice, which is essence of democracy, right? And I was exercising free will. The Baltimore Orioles are now owned by a worse owner than Steinbrenner. He's destroying the team. So democracy is getting up off the ground after you've made some bad choices and believing that what you do can make the place where you live and the people around you um, the place a little better, um, the people a little better nurtured and to keep on going despite getting knocked down sometimes by your own choices sometimes by fate sometimes by politics but always having exercising the choice to make things better we don't disagree does this mean that you would not uh, change your allegiance from the new york yankees if you had to do it over again you would no, simply it means, work it means that if I had been smart, I would have picked the Florida the Marlins years ago. <laughs> uh, Roger, uh, I don't think we should uh, descend into a competition 
about who lived closer to the Yankee Stadium. Because <laughs> I live six blocks away there. <laughs> when I think of the word patriotism, which I think is a word which has been very much abused lately, uh, especially by, by this administration, which has assigned a, an act to uh, repress our civil rights and has managed to call it the Patriot Act, and that becomes kind of a joke after a while, although a rather sad joke. When I, uh, I don't think that uh, any child of immigrants to this country needs to be taught about patriotism. Uh, we really get patriotism with our mother's milk. Why? Because in most cases, we came from somewhere to come to a place which offered us greater opportunity, greater fulfillment than we would have known had we remained in the countries we came from. So in that sense, patriotism is given to us. But then there's something else to say about patriotism. We use the word patriotism very easily. We fly flags very easily. After 9-11, the country was simply flourishing with flags on cars and flags on everything. And what I didn't hear very much of is a word that I associate very closely with patriotism. And that word is sacrifice. We had uh, uh, somebody ask President Bush at one of his first press conferences after 9-11 about sacrifice, and he said, go home and hug your kids and go out and do shopping, which will help the economy a great deal. Um, and I went back and I read the, the wonderful speech of President Franklin Roosevelt in 1942, which was called a call to sacrifice. And he told people that they would have to give up a lot of the things they were accustomed to. There would be rationing, there'd be rationing of meat and gas, and, a lot, and that they were asked to do this for their country. I wait to hear the word patriotism used not as a cover for an attack on our civil liberties, but used as you owe something to the country and you have to make a sacrifice to get there. That I have heard very little. Jill? As somebody who's lived in three different countries and functioned as a citizen in all of them, um, I have a rather different perspective. I was born in Australia, and it's impossible for an Australian patriot um, to be accepting of public authority because the tradition of the country was established by convicts. And the regime which controlled them was one they despised. So civic virtue in their minds became an absolutely iron will never to surrender to illegitimate authority. And for an Australian, um, patriotism has the aura of uh, uh, being somebody who will not accept the state and will not accept um, a, a conventional view of what love of country is. And anybody who goes and listens to a debate in the Australian Parliament will instantly become aware um, that these are, are fighting people who have no respect for um, their betters. Um, it's complicated for Australia as it tries to think about becoming a republic because it really has no idea of civic virtue which would be committed to the state. And, and that's a problem in the whole debate about republicanism. Uh, I left Australia because it was not a society at that time, changed a lot since, uh, which accorded very much, if any, opportunity to women who wanted to be intellectuals, scholars, or uh, active professionals. Uh, came to the United States, loved it, uh, married a Canadian, went to live in Canada. That's a society that had to build its identity on two founding peoples, French speaking and English, and had to build its national identity out of the recognition of, tolerance of, and actually glorification of difference. So patriotic statements are viewed somewhat skeptically in Canada, patriotic in the sense of claiming to stand for the values of the state because they're very different in many different regions of the country. 
so in in that setting to be patriotic is to recognize difference not to assert yourself too strongly over against the rights of others and to believe that diversity of opinion is the most important thing that the state should foster and and support uh, of course like everybody uh, in my profession in the academic world I eventually came to the United States attracted by what Daniel mentioned the incredible opportunities of this country and um, for a long time I did not become a citizen uh, it wasn't necessary uh, to advance in my career or professional life and um, I found it very hard to uh, make the Pledge of Allegiance initially uh, because I came out of these two very different traditions uh, in which one does not exalt the flag or the Pledge of Allegiance is something that runs totally against the grain of someone born in Australia. You would never do that. Um, so it was not until I saw the United States in what I perceived as some rather major and significant political trouble uh, that I decided to become a citizen. And as I was telling people before uh, uh, coming here uh, to speak, I actually made the decision uh, so that I could vote against Ronald Reagan in the first election. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> what I'd like to leave in your minds is that, that in many parts of the world, um, the reverence accorded the founding fathers and the political structure of this country isn't possible. Uh, and so feelings of love of one's country are directed on the earth, the natural environment, uh, the um, actual lived experience in relation to nature. So if you ask a Canadian to identify something that stands for their country, they'll talk about the frozen north. Uh, and if you ask an Australian, they'll talk about the, the red heart of Australia and its deserts. Um, and those stand in place for um, a, a unified political identity. Of course, I've come to understand the United States as a society of such diversity that its political system has to generate consensus. Uh, but there lies a problem within that need to generate consensus when it becomes overwhelming or crushing. And then I think the virtues of my old Australian rebels would be valuable. Roger, I wonder, you know, we heard from, from uh, Carolyn Kennedy uh, a statement from Frederick Douglass about uh, his uh, obviously justifiably tortured attitude toward calls for patriotism in light of the experience of, of African Americans at his time. Uh, now a lot has happened since then. Uh, not all of it good, but a great deal of it uh, good uh, in terms of the status of African Americans. Would you say at this point that patriotism means the same thing to African Americans that it means to everyone else, or are there still significant differences of perspective because there is a there is a different past there is a different uh, uh, set of shared experiences that go back many many years and cannot be at least this quickly eradicated I can't speak for obviously all black people and, I, and there are generational differences but um, I wasn't, I'm kind of like Jill. I wasn't really born in this country, even though it was physically in a hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. But I was born into segregation. And that's not just kind of old back of the bus or different drinking fountain or different school. I was shunning. That was a whole nation saying to us, 
that you are so inferior, so unpalatable, uh, and your history of your people um, is, is, is so uncivilized that you aren't fit to be with us except to clean up after us. And you certainly aren't fit to enjoy any of the great honors and privileges of the society. And that's what I learned. That's the America I learned. And I learned that all this wonderful stuff about the founders and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence didn't apply to me. That matter of fact, the Constitution said, as it was interpreted in those days, that I could continue to be shunned by my own government. And it was so shattering. Um, and yet, World War II occurred while I was a child and while there was still segregation. And I wanted to fly a P-51 Mustang against the Luftwaffe over Europe. So there was enormous conflict, which I did not resolve really until um, a few years ago when I wrote Jefferson's Pillow, The Dilemma of Black Patriotism, in order to explore those themes. This is even after all the progress, some of which I participated in helping to bring about. And uh, helped do it with the aid, uh, with, with, with the support of President Kennedy and President Johnson. And they gave me the opportunity to work on these issues in a meaningful way. But ultimately, for black people, you have to unravel so much the, the lies about the founding, for example, that blacks had nothing to do with the founding. Well, blacks were 20% of the founding generation. They were a significant part of uh, General Washington's army. Um, and they did everything in the army except tell white people what to do. But um, um, only after you learn only after you cleanse yourself of all of the garbage, really, that the society has put into you. And then if you're lucky, as I was, to participate in these efforts that help change the country, what happened to me was I reassessed what those activities were about. And they were about what Martin said. He said, I have a dream. But the really important thing about that, what he said about I have a dream, I have a dream that is deeply rooted in the American dream. And the fact was that all of that civil rights activity was not just us against the white folks, as many of us thought as we were doing it, but it was us for American ideals as we understand them. And in that sense, um, I came to understand it as a profoundly patriotic activity um, and understood that, that a lot of my black heroes were deep, profound patriots and that, in fact, I'd been really patriotic for a long time. I think most American blacks aren't lucky enough to have had the richness of that, that experience and then to go and be a history professor so you can figure out what it was that you just lived through and what your soul went through. Um, I think an awful lot of black people do understand how much change has been made because of our ideals. But we also know how much more needs to be done and how little um, answer we get when we speak to America about that. And I think young people who are activists are still about as angry and as bitter as I was when I was a young person because they haven't lived through the changes I lived through. They can't see how different the country is, but they can surely see how many young blacks are still being destroyed because the country is not interested. So the, the answer is mixed. Um, it's, it's, and that's, is it possible to disentangle that by suggesting that patriotism is a kind of loyalty to a set of ideals of America at its best, 
rather than an unquestioning loyalty of a country or a regime or something like that? Well, you know, I really kind of live by um, Edmund Burke's um, aphorism that the only thing that um, is required for evil to prevail is for good people to remain silent. And the terrific thing about this country is that uh, nobody can silence you. And that as long as you can have a voice and struggle to make things better, um, you, you really have life. And in this country, you have that. No matter how bad things get, there's always an opportunity that they will get better at the next turn of the wheel and you just keep on going with that faith. And yeah, a country which engenders that kind of faith is a country uh, in which you surely can be patriotic. Robert Pitsky, you've escaped thus far. <laughs> but I'm wondering, since you are really, although you're many other things as well, you are the artist among us, do artists have a different sense of patriotism? Do their loyalties run to something that transcends nation and national phenomena, or are they just like everybody else as far as patriotism is concerned? Every artist is born somewhere to somebody, mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps because the material for the artist is uh, an urgent question, the artist has to think about where you come from. Um, if you're an orphan, you still come from somewhere and you think about it, most artists are involved with things that they were born with. And um, I guess no one has pointed out yet that patriotism comes from a Latin and then a Greek word referring to your parents. Mm -hmm. And um, I know things about my family. I can tell you what's right with my family and wrong with my family at greater length and in more detail than anyone here. <laughs> And uh, it's a mixture of good reasons and irrationalities that make me loyal to where I came from mm -hmm. and my family. Um, similarly, if I'm amongst people who are not Americans, I probably know more about Americans, the American racial divide. I probably have more experience of the American uh, uh, adventure in Southeast Asia. I say experience, not necessarily knowledge. Uh, I can tell those people more things that are wrong with my country and more things that are right about it than many of them because I've experienced it. This is similar to my family. In this country, when a child sings, land where my fathers died, we are free. It's like a work of art because we are encouraged to take that metaphorically. If your father came from Honduras, or Poland, or Korea, I hope you are encouraged, I was encouraged, to sing that phrase and to think of the founding fathers as if they were our fathers. This is like making a work of art. For a mixture of good reasons and irrationalities, I say, good or bad, slave owners and imperialists and uh, extorters and uh, expropriators or heroes and 18th century idealists and beautiful agnostics, whatever they are, I know them and they're my fathers. It's like my family. And like my family, I get very angry at it. Like my family, I'm loyal to it. At the risk of being maudlin, I'll mention that my father, my actual father, died a couple of weeks ago. And the photograph of him uh, in the Long Branch, New Jersey Daily Record he is there with um, maybe a dozen other young men. All of these young men in the stressful year 1934, when the picture was taken, have a six-pointed star of David on their garment. They're looking at the camera with this thing on their shirts. My father is holding a trophy. His best friend, Davy Becker, is holding a basketball, and it says on the basketball, City Champs, 1934. I assume that my father and Davy Becker were not unaware 
of what was happening in Europe at the time. I actually have no idea what they were thinking. I know some of them later died there. They were not unaware of it. I would assume it was a, it was a team, basketball, by the way, used to be a Jewish game. It's a city game, like boxing. Whoever happens to be living in the city at the time tends to supply the fighters and the basketball players, in those days anyway. The Jewish aces, I'm proud to tell you, were city champs, and um, my dad was a star. <laughs> he was a good player. I assume that they, I know from having gone to their reunions and talked to them about it, they knew that it took a certain nerve, there was a certain jauntiness and defiance in the name of the team, and that they had to be good, or they would be the more ridiculed. I assume that this act of, it's like a work of art, this act of imagination, uh, same with the Jewish aces, we're playing this game of basketball. Uh, I more than assume, uh, I actually know that it was also an expression of their feeling that though they had no illusion that America was perfect, or that America always welcomed, welcomed them in every conceivable way, it was also an act uh, of um, patriotic Americans. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was thinking as you spoke about the sort of new twist that you gave to that famous remark of Thomas Jefferson's. Of, My fathers were ignorant, were, were immigrants so that their sons could play basketball, so that their sons could become poets. So, and, uh, <laughs> uh, before we leave these sort of definitions, there is something I alluded to in my opening remarks that, that I'd like to put to, to Louis Manan, and that is, uh, and maybe you'll just dispute my characterization, but I think it's fair to say that, that patriotism tends to elicit quite different, more skeptical, even more hostile reactions among intellectuals than, say, among blue-collar workers. And uh, I guess that's where Samuel Johnson's quote about the last refuge of scoundrels, I mean, is part of that tradition. Uh, and surely there are various critics who pointed out that uh, that tradition of skepticism uh, persists in universities and other intellectual circles even today. Would you agree that there is a certain skepticism about the patriotism and its uh, usage in the United States yeah. among intellectuals, and do you have an explanation as to why that might be, if you um, see some truth in it? Yeah, I do. Uh, the explanation is uh, it's our job. Uh, I put it this way. Um, when the United States entered the First World War, Congress passed an act which made it a federal crime <coughs> to say anything against the government policy of intervention in the war in Europe. It was called the Espionage Act and later called the Espionage and Sedition Act. The president of Columbia University took it upon himself to announce at commencement exercises that any faculty member at Columbia who spoke out against the war effort would be fired. John Dewey, the American philosopher, was then a member of the philosophy department at Columbia. And he took a great, great exception to the president's statement. This president was Nicholas Murray Butler, a very famous president of Columbia who went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize um, many years later. Uh, Dewey spoke out against Butler's announcement. Now, keep in mind that when Butler said this, it actually was a crime because Congress had passed this act for anybody to speak out against the war effort, against the draft, or in any other way, against, against the manufacturer of military supplies, or anything else that would impede the uh, administration's policy. Dewey made the following argument. The argument was that it was wrong for Butler to suppress dissent on the Columbia campus among its faculty because of the principle of academic freedom, which was a relatively new principle in American academic life at the time of the First World War. Dewey was not saying that academics should be allowed to say anything they want just because they're professors or just because they have tenure. He was saying essentially this, that in a free society, each of us 
has a different task to perform. And in a free society, it's the job of the soldier to fight, and it's the job of the intellectual to think. Yes, academics are skeptical, skeptic, skeptical about concepts like patriotism. They're skeptical of all concepts, or they ought to be, because the academy is a place in which assumptions that the rest of us share in daily life, as a matter of course, can be questioned and can be examined. The mere act of questioning them should not be taken as unpatriotic. I think perhaps the most moving uh, uh, statement of that came after John McCain was released from prison in Vietnam and reporters asked him, were you aware while you were in prison with two broken legs uh, and a dislocated shoulder and lousy food for over two years, were you aware of the fact that there were people protesting the war in which you had suffered these injuries for your country? Uh, and he said, yes, I was aware of it. And they, and they asked him, well, what did you think about that? And he re replied, I thought that was why we were over there fighting. Uh, which is, uh, since we often criticize politicians, it seems to me that's a rather eloquent yeah, statement of, of exactly, exactly what you said. Is that he, later on, when he came back to Washington, uh, he became very good friends and a great supporter of one of the leading and most virulent anti-war protesters of the time when he was in prison in North Vietnam. And uh, the man uh, developed uh, illness and died, and McCain was always a supporter of him and by his side. Uh, he understood, I think, as many uh, soldiers have, that the right to dissent, uh, in fact, the necessity of dissent or questions is part of what they're fighting for. Yeah, reason, I, yes. I think it's important to say that uh, in Luke's remarks, was a reminder that academics have not always been marvelously critical and outspoken. Academics often perform, and intellectuals often historically perform in ways that are extremely sheep-like and uh, uh, inadequate and uh, uh, timid. It's also important to remember the converse, that many people who are not intellectuals or academics, including anti-war protesters and uh, uh, if you look at the history of court cases in the United States, there are many working class people who are in the uh, tradition of uh, uh, the Twain piece on patriotism and Caroline Kennedy's book and Whitman saying each person in that one way that is his or her own, that individualism is not uh, uh, without also a, a, a side that's critical and it is certainly not uh, necessarily the province of university campuses. In my observation and experience, perhaps not. Good. Daniel? This uh, raises another word that's often used in association with patriotism, and that word is loyalty. Uh, I am, I guess, maybe the oldest person on this platform, and remember vividly the loyalty investigations undertaken by Senator Joe McCarthy and others. Uh, I myself, working then at CBS as late as 1953, was asked if I would sign a loyalty oath. And uh, I shall always look back to that time and that period of the loyalty oath at a time when ideas, which should have been great ideas, were debased. I mean, I can understand the loyalty of free people. I can understand all kinds of loyalty. But a loyalty oath, I swear that I will be loyal, seems, as I look back on it today, almost impossible that America um, ever stood for such a thing. So. I hope we will take our words back, words like patriotism and words like loyalty, which are very good words, and at one time or another, we're almost lost. The one thing I want to say is the only one word that I would use about patriotism is that patriotism, to me, in its essence, is non-exclusionary. It has to be non-exclusionary. If you use loyalty to say, you're, you're, I'm loyal and you're not, I'm patriotic and you're not, my American flag is bigger than your American flag. As soon as you hear the word, uh, these words used in that way, you know that somebody is excluding somebody. You asked the question earlier, is it that intellectuals, feet people like that, are refused to accept the loyalty that Joe Sixpack has? Yes, if Joe Sixpack defines loyalty in the way that I've heard some Joe Sixpacks define it, you lose me. I'm one of those intellectuals.
Roger. When Dan said uh, your American flag, my American flag is bigger than your American flag, it reminded me. Um, my wife and I actually, we live close enough to the Pentagon to have seen it immediately after the plane flew into it on 9-11, and there was a lot of other stress at that moment. So a few days later, we decided to take a long weekend at the beach, and as we're going through the town of Ocean View, Delaware, we saw one of these roadside signs, you know, you put the letters on it, and by that time, there were no flags to be had anywhere in the country. Everybody had bought up all the flags. And on this sign, it said, be patriotic. Return my flag. God bless America. <laughs> uh, you know, we've had this, this, this country is prone to these loyalty fevers. I mean, we had the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, we had a, had a lot of uh, unpleasantness during the Civil War. And we had the Palmer Rays, and we had McCarthyism, and now we've... And when I think of those things, you know, I, I, I think about what it is about this country that really turns me on, I really go back to the roots. Um, there was a period from 1765, the Stamp Act crisis, to 1775, when the Revolutionary War started, when the Patriots, it was a period of John Adams called the Real American Revolution, and the Patriots paid attention to what was going on, they, they read, they talked to each other, they wrote letters to each other, they met, they created institutions, finally created a Congress, then another Congress, then an army, and then a government, and a revolution. And it was active citizenship at kind of the highest level that you can imagine. Well, then you skip ahead about 12 years, and um, the story is told that uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin came out of uh, the Constitutional Convention and these 55 American politicians had done something that no 55 American politicians have ever done since. That is, they kept the secret all summer long. <laughs> and when they came out, he came out, uh, Franklin was asked by a woman, well, what have you made for us in there, Dr. Franklin? And he said, um, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And if you can keep it really are the operative words. It seems to me that that, that um, expresses a democratic faith that these people had, that they really did what they were supposed to do. They faced the problems of their time at their time uh, as energetically and as intelligently and as bravely as they could. And they expected each generation of us afterwards to do the same, through thick or through thin. And um, um, that always comes back to me when I remember my college days, the McCarthy years, when on my campus there were several professors who were stripped of their, of their um, tenure and fired um, because of suspicions or because they wouldn't name names or whatever it was. And it has seemed to me to be the marriage of what Franklin said in 1787, um, the protests of the patriots in the 10 years leading up to the revolution, to stand up to that kind of stuff. I mean, I think that is the essence of what Franklin was talking about. If you can keep it, it's easy to be a patriot when everybody is at a picnic on the 4th of July. But to fight for American principles when the people have the power are, have lost their heads, that's when, it's, that's, 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 when it, that's when patriotism is really on the line. And uh, something I learned when I was in college. In that sense, I'm just 
wondering. You've been very good about putting all this in a historical perspective. Do you or any other of us on the panel uh, have any sense of whether patriotism has declined in recent generations? Do you, do you see any sense in which patriotism has declined, or you think it's as alive and well as it's ever been? I'll tell you one thing that I think. I think that it was a big mistake to get rid of the draft, um, because I think that there was one wonderful thing that happened to us when we had the draft. That is, each one of us, when we got to be 18 years old, uh, each guy had to have a draft card in his pocket. And that meant that you had to have a conversation with yourself about the obligation you owed to your country. And um, I got drafted on a, after I got out of law school. And I was on a bus from Grand Rapids, Michigan, to Detroit, Fort Wayne, the induction center. And I looked around, and there were all these, I was 25, there were all these 18-year-old kids. And I was going to be with them, and I was going to have sergeants white sergeant from the South sometime, telling me what to do. I knew I did not want to go into this army. I knew I did not want to spend my next two years doing that. And I had a conversation with myself. Even then, when I hadn't worked all this other patriotism stuff out, I said, this country has been good to you. Even with this, the segregation, even with the limitations, even with the hurts to the soul. It's been good to you. You owe it something. It's just time for you to give back. I did have that conversation with myself. I think it is really important for young people. I teach young people all the time. And I find it necessary to say to them, in virtually every class I teach, that the people who are in cemeteries out there in Arlington or wherever it is, do not die in order for you to spend your afternoons at the mall. And I don't like the fact that we are now fighting a war with um, basically uh, kids from poor families whose chances in life are essentially enhanced by the fact that they can go in the army. I think it should be broadly shared. So in that sense, I think that we have lost something. Um, Dan started out talking about sacrifice. I do think that um, willingness to sacrifice for uh, what you believe in and for a community that has nurtured you is part of patriotism when we don't ask much of that these days. Roger, would you accept national service, not necessarily military service, in Oh Senator yeah, I, I would certainly. I would. I would want both. But yes, I would. I would certainly want national service. Yeah. Eric, I think it's it's interesting. Um, if we look back to the origins of the modern notion of of patriotism, which uh, comes out of the citizen armies of the French Revolution and the American War for Independence, um, at that point the notion of patriot and loyal citizen was distinctly male and women were excluded from the notion of citizenship and it, indeed um, they, they had very few political rights, if any. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, it, quite striking is the extent to which as women have been granted full citizenship uh, including uh, the obligation or the opportunity of military service, um, I think there's a, a notable rise in, in patriotic feeling in terms of an obligation to the state um, among young women, at least the ones I teach, uh, which wasn't, wasn't there 30 years ago. Um, Modern wars, of course, require, just as, as uh, we all know, uh, the organization of the home front as well. But the, uh, the, the situation of having to ask yourself that question that is now something young women do too, 
uh, is a is a, a very dramatic change. Um, so I think it has seen the rise in patriotic feeling and sense of obligation among one uh, group in in society, while I think it's declining, as at least as I see it among people I teach. So I was going to say, what do you make of the fact that every generation since uh, the generation that grew up in the New Deal has voted significantly less than the preceding generation, so that less than a third of young people under the age of 25 even vote in presidential elections. Doesn't that suggest some lack of patriotism in the best sense? I mean, uh, quite apart from making the great sacrifice of being drafted and fighting in a war, isn't the least you can expect of a patriot that at least they will take seriously their obligation to go to, pol to the polls in a democracy? And what do you make of the state of patriotism in a country where, for 40 years now, fewer and fewer people have felt it um, worth their while to go and cast a ballot? Lewis? Well, um, I, when you asked the question, has, has patriotism declined, I was a little surprised even that you would ask it, because it feels to me that we're awash in patriotism, um, that, that um, in particular, since 9-11, there's been uh, a kind of official um, um, mood of uh, America firstism. And I think that it's understandable on one level, but on another level it can be very suffocating. So I think maybe to my mind, the, if I were to try to summarize what we've been saying so far this afternoon on the panel, I think everyone's said patriotism involves thinking about it. It's not just a reflex. Um, and I think that there is a kind of we're number one quality to a lot of patriotism that's out there in the culture today. But it's a little scary because it then serves to justify all kinds of actions around the world that, uh, that are maybe not so smart. And it also, I think, um, has a retrograde quality in a, in a, on a planet in which everything is happening globally now. We don't want to define ourselves against France. We don't want to define ourselves against Iran or against Iraq. We want to define the world in such a way. We want to define the world in such a way that what we have in common is what we're proud of and what we work for, not what we have that's different. So I think on the bad side of what patriotism stands for, I would say we have rather too much of it. To paraphrase again, I think a very important thing Daniel Shore said to paraphrase it, uh, the unpatriotic, any occasion, any use of it I can think of, is a noxious concept and a noxious term. Uh, and it's not only that I don't like it, there's something poisonous about the notion of the unpatriotic. And uh, it's one reason that uh, one has an in, sort of intuitive uh, uh, dislike of the Patriot Act, even if you haven't read it, or if you've only read a little bit of the summaries in it, it implies the concept of the, that suddenly there's a legislation that is going to tell you whether you are or are not patriotic. The concept of not being patriotic, and going back to the sense of my family, there's, some, there's a nonsense or something poisonous about the idea that somehow I would stop being Robert. Uh, uh, that um, uh, that uh, the negative of the concept is probably a more politically crucial term, and in a way the unpatriotic is something we should think about uh, very seriously. And uh, the rhetoric of giving that uh, uh, countries of laws that name is um, dangerous. I, th I, think, I think your remark about the low voter turnout mm -hmm. and increasingly low voter turnout is very important. And it's a question of why. I don't have figures on it, but I am con convinced that the low voter, the, the, the debasement of the voter turnout is runs along with the debasement of government. We've had very, very lousy governments. I recall one person who said, I don't vote, it just encourages them. <laughs> I, I, I want to agree with, with you. I hope you don't subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> I, want to, I want to agree with Lou. Um, I do believe that we have far too much patriotic talk today uh, and it 
it is, to me, an extreme version of, of the need to manufacture consensus that has to undergird keeping such a large and diverse population and country uh, operating under one government. But um, the history of the United States shows that there are periods in which that manufacturing of consensus goes overboard. And we've heard examples about it in 1914-18, in and um, I think uh, very clearly uh, the suppression of dissent uh, in, in the entry of the United States into the Second World War, and of course the, the uh, way in which uh, critics of the war in Vietnam were responded to. Um, so perhaps one of the things we need to distinguish in our conversation is um, manufactured pseudo-agreement about a set of national goals and objectives versus what's been stressed over and over again, which is thoughtful and in, informed and, and self-aware understanding of, um, uh, of what may be a particular political program. And the tendency to describe as patriotic all who agree, if relatively mindlessly, is one we're fighting today, I think. Well, you know, I, I agree with that. But, you know, I think that political leaders um, really can um, encourage patriotism without being um, heavy-handed or negative. Um, I have two examples come to mind. Dan's um, Roosevelt speech about, pay, uh, about sacrifice um, or President Kennedy's inaugural. Ask not uh, what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. It, if, if it is a positive uh, exhortation, you get one effect. If it's let's be against somebody, and, and, and the against somebody really brings out the hoo-ha, flag-raising, and non-thinking, scary kind of, of patriotism. But the, the other... Fan version. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I think we've reached the point I said, where it I said would be nice Yankee to get a little there. participation from the audience. Uh, I think perhaps the way we would do that are there, there are microphones, and so that everyone in the room can hear the questions being asked. I guess I would ask anybody who would like to, to pose a question to go to one of the microphones and speak into it so that we can all hear the question and respond to it. Uh, so are there, are there any questions about this topic that um, otherwise we'll retreat into our private club again? But I think it would be very much more interesting if some of you got up and... Uh, and put questions to uh, to the panelists. Good. Hi. Um, I have a question uh, regarding like patriotism and uh, politics. Uh, during the 2002 elections, we saw Democrats like Senator Max Cleland attacked as unpatriotic because he he did not support President Bush's policies. Um, do you think that this is evidence of an attempt by the right to hijack patriotism for political use? <laughs> Well, simple answer is yes. Yes, Daniel, I was going to call on you. Uh, maybe you should repeat that because it was lost in the laughter. Uh, the, simple, the simple answer to that question is yes. <laughs> I would also say that that campaign and the, the, the perpetrator's name should forever live in infamy. Saxby Chambliss's campaign against Max Cleland was one of the most disgusting graceful campaigns that I have ever heard of. Here's a guy who's lost limbs out um, fighting for the United States, and this bozo has the nerve to say that he doesn't, he's not sufficiently patriotic. That's just tr truly obscene. Well, one good thing about this panel, you can't accuse us of giving wishy-washy answers. <laughs> so you ask the question and there it is, yes. Um, I, ha I wonder about, I think now, especially with globalization, 
I think there are a lot of people who loyalty is more with humanity and the, you know, the earth and the world, and is. I think I'm as concerned about an Egyptian as I baby as I am about an American baby. So I wonder if that makes me or people like me unpatriotic. I just want to make a quick remark about young people who may not vote, but they are out doing so much courageous stuff, um, you know, like taking on the WTO and so forth. So anyway, I'll go back to my question, but I did want to make that whether they're voting or not, I think there are a lot of young patriots. Thank you. Let, let me take your first question and put it to the panel. I, I would just say that uh, the remark that you've given really echoed a very celebrated debate in Boston in something called the Boston Review, where one philosopher, Martha Nussbaum, said we should no longer be think of ourselves as citizens of one country, but as citizens of all humankind, that our loyalties, maybe our patriotism, should go to everyone in a global society and not to war, just maybe. particular groups. What do some of you on the panel think of that? Um, I, I, I agree with the questioner's uh, point of view, and I, I was struggling to say that a little earlier. Um, another way to say it would be that um, President Kennedy did say ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, though he didn't mean by that at the expense of other countries. But he also said what I think has always been the most stirring thing he said uh, in his presidency, ich bin ein Berliner. Um, and after 9-11, I was, that, was reminded of that because the French newspaper famously published an editorial that said, nous sommes tous les Américains, we're all Americans. That's the most moving thing that people can do in the world. And it's true also that we're all connected now in a way that we weren't 100 years ago. And if we have to rethink what we mean by patriotism because of that, then by all means we should do so. Um, let me respond to you. I mean, I, I certainly agree with uh, the sentiment, but Having tried, I know that there's a limited amount that I can do for a baby in Egypt or Sudan or Zimbabwe. Um, I do know, however, that my country, when it is operating at its very best, when it is trying very hard to live up to its ideals, um, is an enormous force for good in the world. If you look back on some of the great achievements of the 20th century, the United Nations, for example, um, it came about because, or the Marshall Plan, or uh, it, it, they, these things came about because of, of the idealistic and humanistic strain in American political thought. And it seems to me that serving that part of who we are and serving it energetically and having it be the driving force in American politics is not only a wonderful way to express patriotism, but also to ensure that our collective strength as a people is used for those global, noble global aims that, that, that you and I share. My response to you would be to say, we're all territorial animals. That's what humans are. And we all have to relate to some piece of this earth as a place where we belong. But that doesn't mean that we cannot develop a strong sense of responsibility and care and concern for the whole planet and its population. But I think the, the dream that has inspired reformers since the early days of the socialist movement when it was thought that the working class around the world would be able to unite to build a better future didn't hold up in war after war. I think we have to hope to develop a strong civic and moral consciousness and awareness within whatever part of the world we are rooted. And part of that has to be a larger 
um, public spirited concern for the whole planet. But I think it's it's um, a psychological mistake to believe that we can all love everywhere in every part of the globe, every jungle, every monkey, every um, uh, alligator, uh, and all the human beings and all the different cultures in the same way. I think we have to do it differently. Let me, uh, uh, if I could. Okay, I'm a little concerned about the other I question. Part in that panel to Mark and Ms. Baum and respond to the same question. Yes. I don't like Jill's remarks. The panel was good. later became a book. It's called something like Patriotism and Cosmopolitanism. I hope in my conduct and my thinking I would be exactly the same as an Egyptian baby as an American baby. But to be psychologically realistic, I know that my responsibilities, my effects, my language, all sorts of things about me, rational and irrational, are a little bit more as though that baby were in my family. I hope I would feel the same about your child as about my child, but it would be foolish of me not to acknowledge that the feelings about my child are different. And uh, true cosmopolitanism, or true universality, can't just be invented as an abstraction. It comes from our experience of what is immediately around us. Fair enough. Yes. Yes, thank you. My question is a simple one, um, and I know Mr. Pinsky briefly touched upon it. Um, it's that based on the principles that this country was founded upon, is the Patriot Act unpatriotic? <laughs> is the Patriot Act unpatriotic? Would you like to respond? Yeah, that, I, that's another quick yes, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a thorough debasement of wonderful words to use them for purposes which are almost the opposite of what the words should connote. I mean, to say that uh, an act which uh, allows you to arrest people and put them in jail without lawyers, even Americans, and, uh, 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 and, and simply take the a series of uh, amendments to the Constitution and put them away for a while, if that be patriotism, then I resign. You know, there was a time in Dan's life and mine when the House of Representatives had an oxymor oxymoronically named committee, the Un-American Activities Committee. And I would say that uh, the uh, Patriot Act authorizes Un-American Activities. <laughs> yes. Um, first, thank you all for sharing your time with us today. Um, the question I had is actually half a statement, half a question. But I was wondering, um, Louis Manana, I know you spoke a little bit about the, the rift between the blue collar versus the, versus the uh, academia uh, as far as the resistance to, to this jingoistic fervor that we see in this country right now. Um, I was wondering how much of that you think can be attributed to primary education in this country. Um, if you've ever looked at a history book, for example, <laughs> For, for a high school history book, it's, it's really quite a joke. Um, and you really don't get that dispelled until you reach college. Until you, re you then you can really start delving into things. But these people, uh, you know, myself included, I did not get a four-year education, but it seems to me that um, it's really a disservice to, to the primary, to, the, to those in primary education to, uh, to have such a limited view of reality. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably something that um, would be a cause of the difference that uh, Professor Bach cited between different views about patriotism. Um, the views that we have about anything are a matter of education and acculturation. It can come from school. It could also come from one's family or one's peers, sometimes just life experience. So I wouldn't say it's all a matter of what school you went to or what kind of textbooks you read, it has to do with the whole package of where you came from. Um, but I think what I tried to suggest was that at, we've seen, particularly in the last 20 years, I think a lot of efforts to drive a wedge between intellectual culture in the United States and what we might call popular culture. Um, and I think one of the people actually who's done a great deal to show the continuities uh, and the fundamental cohesion of intellectual life and popular life is Mr. Pinsky and his work as Poet Laureate uh, and since then. 
Uh, it's a false dichotomy to draw. It's divisive. I think it's done in, in, a, in, a, um, in a cynical way. Um, but I think that it, it does, there is a sense in which the groups don't talk to each other in the way that they ought to in American life. Uh, there's lack of respect on both sides that's a result of this. It's one of the things I think this administration uh, is happy to have persist in the form that it has taken. An important and unacknowledged theater in all this is the two-year colleges and universities in the United States, uh, where the average age of the student is probably about 40 or 35, where the uh, minority enrollment is probably 60 or 65 percent, where a lot of the uh, manners and the general background is what you, you've called blue collar. It's a more important theater in many ways than the theater in which we keep track of what were the Ivy League professors signing in the way of loyalty acts, what were they not signing in a particular decade. decade. It's a terribly important area in American life uh, that, uh, frankly, we don't support enough. So if, you're, if you can give $40 million somewhere, don't give it to Harvard. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in a, in a discussion about patriotism, the issue of privacy often arises, and my question for the panelists today is, do you think the founders consciously wrote a right to privacy in the Constitution, or is this simply a modern interpretation? Could you just repeat that? I had a little trouble following it. Sure. Do you, do you, uh, do you think the founders consciously wrote a right to privacy in the Constitution, or is this simply a modern interpretation? Uh, one, one way to answer that question is to say that the word liberty connotes privacy. Because if you cannot maintain your privacy, you are not free. Yeah, I, th I think, I think yeah. I, that's exactly the logic behind, I think, I assume you're referring to Supreme Court cases that since Griswold against Connecticut in 1965, Roe v. Wade and so forth have supposedly created a right to privacy. I think Mr. Shor's answer is exactly right. Those are cases in which the court said the state's interference with an individual's life violates this right to liberty that people have. You can't have liberty if the state can control your personal life in that way. So I think in that sense it would be implied. You're raising one of the most difficult problems, perhaps as the only lawyer in the group or the only one I know of, uh, and that is the problem of how much respect to give to the literal language of, of a constitution. Uh, if you really tried to be absolutely literal and say exactly what did the founders mean of a document that many years ago, I think the constitution would very quickly become a straitjacket because things change, the country, circumstances arise that the founding fathers never could have anticipated. On the other hand, if you use that rationale as an excuse to say, well, it doesn't really matter what the language is in the Constitution, clearly you've lost all the value that a Constitution gives in providing a, a framework to which we can all relate. So it's a problem of finding some reasonable balance between those extremes, and there is no uh, clearly logical, obviously ab ascertainable answer to that. And so I think the privacy ruling is perhaps one of the most clearest examples that comes a little bit close to not paying much attention at all to the literal language of the Constitution. Uh, but I do think in evaluating that, you have to recognize uh, um, that it is, as one justice pointed out, it is, after all, a living Constitution that has to adapt to some degree to the changing circumstances of a country which is not at all like the one in which the Constitution was originally drafted. Yes? Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Marcus. I'm a core member at City Year. It's a National Youth Service Corps. And my question is um, more along the side of the sacrifice element of patriotism. I truly believe that since 9-11 there's been a rise in our country uh, to patriotism and the strong belief in it. But how do we take that feeling and convert it to action from, you know, this 25 million young people in between the ages of 17 to 24 that can serve their country in the military or AmeriCorps programs or the Peace Corps and... Or City Year. Or City Year, which is also an AmeriCorps program. And how do we really create a movement where our political leaders support nationals and community service? Vote. 
<laughs> Very important. I would like to say that I've heard more stirring one-word answers from this panel than <laughs> any similar group to which I have been. Uh, <laughs> But I, I I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be answer. dismissive of your question, but the very first thing everyone has to do is really, seriously be involved in elections at every level of government, because that's the way we can begin to change the definition. Yes, if you look at polls about young people participating in community programs, you find that the majority of them say this is not a stepping stone to getting more involved in the political process. It's an alternative to politics, which they've given up as hopeless. I think as long as that attitude prevails, it's going to be very difficult to uh, make the kind of progress to which your question alluded. I have been instructed that I should, and this is a very hard thing to do, uh, I've been instructed that I can take one more question and then I would like to turn the podium over to Carolyn Kennedy to offer some closing remarks. That's very hard. I, you've all been standing up there, uh, but I would call on you being the closest to give also, the question. I'm sure it will get another pithy one-word answer from some member of our panel. It might. It might and get then the we will ask pithy. Carolyn to come forward. Um, well, since I was the only woman who stood up here, I figured I would take advantage of that. Um, I just wondered, do you think media is really doing its job to encourage democracy? It might be the same one-word answer as vote, but corporate control of the media is kind of choking the democratic voice right now in terms of feeding us that manufactured consensus that you were talking about. So what can we do to assure that we're hearing enough of both sides of the story, that it's not just a, a small handful of um, market-oriented opinions that are, that are driving our information, so therefore we're really not able to make those thoughtful, informed decisions because we're not getting all of the information. Daniel, you well, as the representative of the media, I'm the representative of are the media, media doing enough to ensure no, that no, all important voices are heard? No, they're not. And it's a favorite subject of mine. Um, uh, uh, because are we are going to get more than a one-word answer? <laughs> well, not many more. Cause I know we're running out of time. That we are running out of time. Uh, Media, the industry now more than as a profession, interested in its own profits and its own bottom line, having determined that sex, violence, car crashes, kidnappings, rape, all of those things um, get more get more attention and more ratings and more money, they go for that. City Year here in Boston, which I know a little bit about because my daughter worked for City Year. It's done a marvelous job, partly because this community, the media in this community have supported City Year. And if the media would think for a minute about what patriotism means for a television network or a large chain of newspapers, they might say, let us take some of the constructive things which lead towards community activism, and let's try to promote them by showing examples of how well they work. Um, I think ask all of you to join me in thanking this panel for the provocative and fantastic discussion that we had. Well, um, and, um, and I would like to thank the, the library board um, and our leadership, John Shattuck, Deborah Leff, um, Paul Kirk, who are here and who lead this institution and make these kinds of forums possible. And to thank really all of you for coming and being willing to really think through these issues. I hope that, um, you know, when you leave this room, you'll take this with you and really think about, I think we've really all heard today that, that thinking is so important, but so is what we do with, with that and what we've heard. And whether it's voting or um, other ways of getting involved, um, I hope that all of you here um, we'll, we'll do that. I think um, it's really such an important part of my father's legacy and, um, and the inspiration that he gave to a whole generation and now generations after that. So thank you all very much for coming, and um, I hope you'll come back. And thank you all for, for the wonderful afternoon.